Hey there, I'm Drew, and you are listening to or maybe watching The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast that covers all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and anxiety recovery. So if you're dealing with things like panic attacks, agoraphobia, OCD, or health anxiety, this is the place for you, and I'm happy you're here. This week on the podcast, we have two absolute legends in the field of anxiety and anxiety disorders. Doctors Sally Winston and Marty Seif are here to talk about anticipatory anxiety. That's that thing where you know you have a scary or challenging thing coming up, and you begin to get really anxious, panic, or worry excessively about it for even weeks before it's going to happen. So let's get to that right now. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is podcast episode number 247, recorded in February of 2023. I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. If you are a first-time viewer or listener and you just sort of stumbled onto the podcast, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I hope you find it helpful. If you're a returning listener or a returning viewer, welcome back. It's good to see you. So this week on the podcast, we have Drs. Sally Winston and Marty Seif on to talk about anticipatory anxiety. That's that thing where you have a challenge coming up, a big exposure, a family function, a trip, a flight, a doctor's appointment or a dentist appointment, and you know that it's going to be scary for you. You know it's going to be challenging and difficult for you, so you begin to get really anxious or you panic or you begin to ruminate and think and worry excessively about the event long before it even happens. That's anticipatory anxiety, and it's incredibly common no matter what variant of an anxiety disorder you're dealing with at the moment. So we're going to get into that. They just wrote a book called Overcoming Anticipatory Anxiety, which we will talk about in the interview. The interview lasts about 20 or 30 minutes. It's chock full of great stuff from two people who absolutely know what they're talking about. But before we get to it, just a quick reminder that The Anxious Truth is more than just this podcast episode. There are 246 other free podcast episodes that came before it. There are three books that I've written about anxiety and anxiety recovery. There are courses and workshops and webinars and all kinds of free social media content all on my website at theanxioustruth.com. If you're following my work and you dig it and you want to find a way to support it, all the ways to do that are also on the website at theanxioustruth.com slash support. Financial support, buying something is never, never required, but always appreciated. And no matter how you support this work, whether it's just writing a podcast review, giving me a five-star rating, or hitting like on a YouTube video, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So go over to theanxioustruth.com and avail yourself of all the resources. Now, let's get into the discussion with Marty Seif and Sally Winston on anticipatory anxiety based on the book that they have written. Come back at the end afterwards. I will give you all of the links, the ways to get the book and all their other books and all the other good stuff that we talk about in this episode. You can find everything, by the way, at theanxioustruth.com slash 247, which is on the screen below me if you're watching on YouTube. Anyway, that's enough of me rambling. Let's get to it right now, and I'll be back at the end to wrap it up. Okay, everybody, as promised... Here with me in the studio, which is the same office I'm always in, and I guess their studios, are doctors Seif and Winston on this side and there, uh, authors of so many of the books I know you all love. I know I'm a huge fan. Today we're going to talk about this one. We're going to talk about anticipatory anxiety because it's this is your newest, your latest, I assume? Yes. Yes, it is. It is called Overcoming Anticipatory Anxiety, and uh, it is written by these two <laughs> pioneers and uh I know for most of you guys, heroes in the field, and I'm fanboying a little bit here, so hang in there with me. But um, yeah, we'll walk through the whole anticipatory anxiety thing. It's a huge topic in, in this community for sure. It stumbles, a lot of people stumble on it. So if you guys are into it, we'll just kind of walk through the book. What what made you, I'll, I'll throw it out to either of you. What made you write this book? What was the impetus to write this one? Oh, I can answer that very easily. Cool. I've had considerable anxiety in my life. And as I struggled to kind of overcome that anxiety, it became very clear to me that there was a distinct component of anxiety, which could only be described as anticipatory anxiety. And uh, um, can I go on and talk a little bit about anticipatory? I mean, anticipatory anxiety is really the anxiety or discomfort or distress that you feel before you do something that makes you anxious or uncomfortable. And although it's not a diagnosis in itself, it's really connected to just about every disorder that has anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder. It's connected to lots of some mood disorders in some way. And it's 
and it's a it's it's really ubiquitous and it is extremely common so if you are concerned about taking an elevator tomorrow and you're worrying about it that's anticipatory anxiety if you have to give a presentation and you're concerned that it may not come out and you're thinking about it the day before that's anticipatory anxiety if you have intrusive thoughts and you're worried about yelling something out in a classroom and you're walking to the classroom that can, is anticipatory anxiety there's a, sometimes there's a real big cognitive component to it where you're worrying about it. And sometimes you can just wake up with a stomach ache and realize that, oh my goodness, I have a test today that I didn't study for. That's the concept of anticipatory anxiety. Um, so I've suffered from it and I've experienced it a lot in my life. And it felt to me that it was something that uh, we should uh, write about. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, it's a kind of a normal part of the human experience, even outside the realm of an anxiety disorder or mood disorder. Everybody, like, you know, oh my goodness, I have a presentation to give. I'm so nervous about it. That's anticipatory. It's an, yeah, it, it's a normal part of human experience because we have an imagination and we think about what's coming up. Yeah. But uh, the reason we wanted to write a book is that if you think about it, anticipatory anxiety is the primary driver of avoidance, avoidance behavior, either behavioral avoidance, like canceling something or trying to get someone else to do it for you, or making excuses all the time to not do something, yeah. um, or, or, or experiential avoidance, which is a way of being in the situation, but also trying really hard not to actually be there or experience it. So because avoidance behavior is so much a part of what drives the disability of anxiety or the things that get in the way of living well, uh, if we felt like this was a topic that was underrepresented and we wanted to address it. I am amazed that nobody has written this book before. Like uh, there, I don't know that anybody has written a book specifically on this, but you're right. It bridges all of the different diagnoses. It's, I, you see it all over this community, regardless of the struggle that anybody has. They deal with mm -hmm. anticipatory anxiety. So one of the things that I loved about the book is the way you, you step through a bunch of different things, which is great. But I always like to acknowledge the challenge that it presents, right? So People that are listening today are dealing with panic disorder. They're dealing with agoraphobia, they're dealing with OCD, hype, uh, health anxiety. And in the end, those challenges are hard enough. Anticipatory anxiety always seems to make the challenge seem even harder than it already is. Like the, it's almost, people interpret it as confirmation that the challenge is in fact damn near impossible. Does that right. resonate with you? Right. If, if I'm as anxious as I am now, and I'm not even there, and it's three weeks from now, what will it be like when I'm actually there? And so what, what we do know is that anticipatory anxiety lies. It, it doesn't tell you the truth about what how things are really going to go or what's really going to happen. It's not a predictor. It's not a warning. It's not a sign. And yet it sure feels like it. Oh, yeah. Feels like. So I, I, that that's well, it goes back to the it, and it, it goes back to the idea that anxiety is a great bluffer. It's a great trickster. It kind of fools you in a, in lots of different ways. Yeah. It also, but it's also very helpful for people to be able to distinguish the fact that there are there is the anxiety of something that they're concerned about. For example, um, I'm afraid of flying. Okay, there's that's a, that's a good one because uh, people often worry about it for a long time beforehand. And there's a the actual anxiety or distress when a person is in the situation that they're concerned about. And then there's a separate component, anticipatory anxiety. And sometimes being able to separate that between the two conceptually is really transformative for people to say, "Oh, this is anticipatory anxiety. This is my imagination in some way." Furthermore, it's a really good, once you get a person to focus on the fact that they're, that this is anticipatory anxiety, it's a really good way to help them focus on the method and the, how can I put it, the mechanism of anxiety generation. Because when you're sitting in your room, in your living room on a Tuesday night, 
getting freaked out about the flight that you're supposed to take on Saturday morning, there's no excuse. You're actually in your imagination. There's no way that you can say, well, I'm afraid that the plane's going to crash. No, you're really in your imagination now. And that's a helpful conceptualization for people and helps us make the point that we want to make, that somehow we, in some way, with our imagination and our thinking and the way we perceive our bodily reactions, that we somehow sort of generate the distress that we feel. Which is super powerful, I think, if you can get people to get on board with that idea. Because so many people in the community we're addressing see the anxiety itself as the problem. So yeah, they're nervous about the challenge because you wrote anticipatory anxiety as being afraid of being afraid of being afraid, which I- Yes, that's the third, that's that's the, it's it's the fear of the fear of the fear. It's like right. the third level of fear. And I think that's pretty accurate. Would you, would you, I think that's, a, that's, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, I mean, would you, Dr. Winston, do you have anything to add on that? Let fear. me give an example of the fear of the fear of the fear, just because it sounds so weird when you just say it that way. Yeah. But the example that we use, uh, I think we use it in the book, um, is I'm afraid of a bee. That's fear. Then I'm afraid that if I see a bee, I'll have a panic attack and drop dead of a heart attack. That's fear of fear. And then I have a camping trip coming up in three months. I'm scared I'm going to see a bee and have a heart attack and die. It's not worth it. I think I'll cancel. That's fear of fear of fear. Yeah. And I, you may have mentioned it, Sally, in, in just a minute ago. I don't remember. But certainly another way of thinking of anticipatory anxiety, it's the avoidant component of anxiety. It's the, it's the, it's the aspect of anxiety that says, let me stay away from it. Oh, yes, you mentioned it a number of times. So you avoid it either physically or, uh, you know, just sort of imagine that you're not there in some way. Okay. And yeah. I think it's mentioning that again. Yeah, experiential avoidance. I think right. but and, people to what the mechanism is could be really helpful for them because often I hear people declare failure because they're having anticipatory anxiety already. Like that's, yeah. I'm not failing already because I feel it. So I love when you say, well, yeah, just recognize what's happening. You're afraid, which is allowed because you're afraid of being afraid of being afraid. It's not a failure. No, and in fact, when you, when you get better and even are able to do all these things, anticipatory anxiety is usually the very last part to go mm. because we can't help ourselves from thinking forward into the future and imagining what might happen and also having memories of things that have happened that intrude into our awareness. So getting out that door or getting over the hump or pressing the submit button or whatever it is that the action um, is, uh, is affected by anticipatory anxiety, even after you've been doing everything pretty well. Um, it's just uh, our body remembers, our mind remembers, and, uh, and we go through the same mechanisms. Um, you know, and we have, uh, you know, if you have an anxiety problem um, and you have a sticky mind, which is one of the things that we talk about a lot, uh, you tend to make the thinking errors and the looping kinds of round and round thinking that sticky minds give you. And that doesn't necessarily go away. So you, again, get tricked by your mind. That's just part of that normal human experience also, like expecting anticipatory anxiety to go for, away forever permanently is not realistic because everybody gets nervous about stuff. You no, know, as a matter of fact, it's the opposite. There are people who comfortably do things over and over and over again and still experience uh, episodes or surges of anticipatory anxiety prior to do that. And to some extent, if a person says, okay, this is my anticipatory anxiety, I know from past experience, it's, it's, it's a poor predictor. I know from past experiences that when I'm in that situation, I do fine. It's a way of managing that anxiety in the present. I, you know, I tell people anticipatory anxiety is real anxiety, but it's anxiety generated by, and it's anxiety generated by your present thoughts but the content of the thoughts are about something in the future, but it's present anxiety and to pay attention to that. And when you're in that situation. Yeah. I had a question the other day from somebody exactly on that. Well, they have a problem with needles and they're doing so much better in their recovery. But if I know that I'm going to the doctor and they're going to stick me, 
even though I've had it done a thousand times, I am freaked out until they do it. And then I'm totally cool. So right. I think it's a great illustration of there are enormous numbers of illustrations of anticipatory anxiety. Partly is I've had so much anticipatory anxiety in my life I can think of it. But for example, one of the, one of the issues that the people who have trouble with elevators, who panic in elevators in some way, it's it's sometimes a, a, a difficult issue to to um, it's a difficult anxiety to manage in some way. Part of the reason is that it's mostly anticipatory anxiety. If you speak to someone, they're in the elevator, and what they're really worrying is when I get to the floor and the elevator stops will the door open? So it's all anticipatory anxiety. And so the actual exposure is just that one second when they wait for, with a pause for the door open. Or another comment is lots of people who, who are afraid of flying, they, they have anticipatory anxiety about, about turbulence. So they're on the plane worrying, and that's anticipatory anxiety, will we hit bumpy air? So it's really, it's when you think of it that way, a lot of our anxieties are in anticipation of what I think frightens me. Yeah, yeah, which makes perfect sense. Living in the future, yeah. Um, it's not always about fear, though. We should also add that sometimes it's about a situation that you think you might not be able to handle or something that you know is going to be disgusting or something that causes you to get angry every single time it happens. And if you find yourself unwilling to experience the emotion or the physical sensations, then you get anticipatory anxiety because you keep hoping that that won't happen. And you keep trying to do something in the present to make the fact that that is likely to happen or might happen um, go away. And so the struggle with the anticipatory anxiety and the struggle whether or not to commit to do the thing that you said you were going to do, that actually increases the anticipatory anxiety. And one of the things that we know is that avoiding a decision about going or trying to make a commitment sort of maybe with a back out plan is actually less helpful than deciding you're going to go no matter how you feel. Or that waffling yeah. back and forth, the indecisive. The waffling, you can call it waffling. It's actually reinforcing in our model. It's actually reinforcing the anxiety, the anticipatory anxiety, the avoidance. And Sally brought something up. You know, you know, when you write a book together, because Sally and I co-author lots of things. Sometimes by the end of the book, you sort of forget who wrote which part and who thought of this things. But but I know that Sally. I mean, I, this is definitely Sally's input. You know, at one point, because she brought, we say that commitment is the antidote to avoidance. Okay, and I know that that's Sally's input. I'm pretty sure you, you and, and, and I think that's a really important issue because the fact is avoidance is what maintains anxiety and commitment, no matter how you feel, is in the long term, what actually is the therapeutic process, the therapeutic ingredient that reduces anxiety in some way. And I think part, a lot of what we, what we talk about in the body of the book are, are subtle ways in which people try to avoid, and then we give them an approach that says, okay, here's how to commit. I think we maybe use the word therapeutic surrender and commit or something, you know, um, but it's the notion of, I'm going to do it. I'm reducing my avoidance and that's going to help me overcome this anxiety. Yeah. I, I think one question I think people usually have is, so are you telling me that if I commit and I, I see this all the time, like my family really wants to go on vacation, but I, I'm still not sure because I'm just getting over my agoraphobia. And so they don't want to buy the plane tickets. I'm going to buy them. No, I'm not. I'm not. And so people, well, if I hit the, bu the buy button, are you telling me that I won't be anxious anymore? And the answer is, no. like, oh, it means you probably will, but at least now you have a path to move through it more productively. Would that? Yeah. Be and yeah. yeah, that's one of the brilliances of uh, the original Southwest model that you could cancel any time. And uh, that was that's actually a problem for people because if you know you can cancel, then you don't you you don't settle in your mind that you're going and. 
that um, back and forth uh, actually escalates your anxiety. But the minute that you do buy your ticket, what happens is that you feel a sense of being trapped and your anxiety does go up. But the important thing about this is that if you understand what anxiety is, you understand it's not dangerous, that it's distress, but it's not dangerous. You're not going crazy. You're not, doesn't mean you can't go. It doesn't mean that you are in danger in some way. Your body is giving you false alarm signals and you have to understand enough about anxiety so that you don't respond to the false alarms as if they're true alarms. Yeah. You know, yeah. Sally, actually, when you're mentioning that, it reminds me, the two general suggestions that we make for people is we'd like people to have a, to change their, a change in well, perspective, that's which we talk about, but also a change in attitude. There's a natural, and what that means is to lean towards anxiety rather than to get away from anxiety. So when you buy your ticket, and I had a lot of experience with that because I ran the Spear of Flying group for for 19 years, we and I would insist that people buy their ticket after the first meeting, and there was a lot of resistance. But it, uh, but when people did it, they realized that they were leaning towards anxiety. You know, it's it's the notion. You know, you can be silly about. It. I tell people, look, a day without anxiety is like a day without sunshine. You know, because the fact is, it allows you to really learn to practice exactly what we're talking about in some way. So it puts you into that, in into that mode. The real issue is people buy a uh, buy a ticket, they get anxious, but that in their mind is not a commitment because then they say, well, I can always go out, maybe I can get a credit, and all these kind of mental machinations. These are actually many avoidances, or as you would say, waffling or back and forth. The notion that I'm leaning into anxiety and I'm not going to allow myself to um, consider the possibility of not doing it, that's a much more productive therapeutic uh, perspective. Well, that puts the target well, beyond well, just the plane, that flight, and onto the rest of your life also. Like if I get better right. in this episode, it helps me later, not just now. Yeah, the, the, um, the important thing is to understand what leaning in really means, because people think that it means that, first of all, that you have to accept being miserable forever, which is not what we're saying. Um, but also people tend to do something called white knuckle or force themselves to do things that they're scared to do with the attitude of hoping that it's over as soon as possible, trying really, really hard not to feel anxious, pushing at themselves in some way that actually isn't very helpful. Um, and that's what we call paradoxical effort. Because one of the things that, uh, that we're aware of is that effort inside the mind works very differently from effort outside the mind. You know, if I want to move a table, I will put my hands on it, put in effort and push, and hopefully it's not too heavy a table and I can move it across the room. But if I have a, a feeling or a thought or a sensation in my body, and I put in the same kind of effort, stop the thought, get rid of the sensation, make this go away, it works backwards. It actually makes it all worse. And so understanding that the inside of the mind doesn't respond to that kind of effort, that you need to be willing to feel what you're feeling, experience what you're experiencing, and not feel like you have to do something to make it go away. And most of the people that we run into, of course, are problem solvers, action people, people who want to figure out a way. And the idea that the way is to not do anything and to allow the experience to unfold is extremely difficult. It's not a natural position to take. Yeah. And so that is part of the training or the or the message of the book is that it's not natural to you. What's going to be natural is to look for a solution, you know, find an answer, analyze this so it'll go away, and all of the ways that people problem solve in the real world, and it doesn't work for this. One of the things that you guys wrote in the book that I had a big 
you know, highlight on was, which I, what I want to do is in our last 10 minutes, I want to connect it to GAD because you did. And I had a huge highlight there because it seems like anticipatory anxiety and the traits of somebody with GAD are a match made in heaven, like the problem solving thing you're just talking about. Then I'm going to talk about how you start to deconstruct some of the beliefs that justify the worry. And then how are you going to get somebody to start to practice, you know, uh, moving through anticipatory anxiety. So the GAD thing, when you connected that, I was, that was one of those fist pump moments. Like, yes, hundred percent correct. This is your experience. I'm guessing they come hand in hand. I would guess. We've believed for a long time that generalized anxiety disorder, it can be looked at as the OCD light because the way that it works is even though the, the content may not be bizarre or strange, it may be things that other people worry about too, the way that it works ha has the same structure as OCD. Starts with a what if, mm -hmm. and then that's your imagination. And then there's something at the end of the sentence, what if something? And then the other side of worry is some attempt to make the worry go away. And that occupies the compulsion place. Usually the compulsions in generalized anxiety disorder are all in your head. Mm -hmm. So they're obvious. So when pe they're not obvious, so that when people say, I want to stop worrying, they don't realize that the worry actually has two parts. There's the pop up what if, and then there's the attempt to make yourself feel better or make the what if go away or make the anxiety or the disgust or the upset that went with the what if go away. And that alternates just the same way as it does in OCD. So it very much uh, is part of a continuum. And um, I think for people like that, that get stuck in those worry about worry, thinking about thinking cycles, you also talked about justified anticipatory anxiety where people want to stand up for it and say, no, no, this is why I'm supposed to think about this continuously and obsessively. So I think mm -hmm. that sort of goes down the road where now you talked about deconstructing some of those false metacognitive beliefs. Can we go through those? Well, they're the really concept, good. first of all, that worrying about well to back up a little bit yeah. uh, worrying can often start out as what we call problem solving trying to solve a problem and we would say that real problem solving comes up with some sort of solution or temporary solution or action plan and then that looping stops worrying is really what ifing about something that either doesn't have an answer or you don't have enough information to get an answer, or it, it, it well, those are two of the major things uh, that worry involved. And as a result, people be often believe that worrying has great beneficial effects. Number one, it keeps them motivated. Number two, it, it sort of makes sure that they're not lazy and keeps them vigilant in some way. If something bad happens, I'll be, I'll be, uh, I'll I'll be prepared for it when in fact when bad things happen most often they come from out of the blue and they blindside us in some way. Um, the other thing is that people often think that they have no control over worrying. And if we go back to what Sally said that there's a two part component to worrying, very often the what if pop up thought we have very little control of, over, but we don't necessarily have to answer it if we take what we consider a metacognitive approach and say, wait a second, this is worry. It's looping thoughts in some way. I don't have to respond to it. I can say, okay, that's my worry thought. And I can go on in some way. It's the attempt to answer the unanswerable um, when you believe there's some benefit to it in some way. Some people believe that work, I'm sorry, Sally, you were going to say something, weren't you? you? I'm sure you have more to say about this if you want. Well, I mean, we could, we we write together. So yeah. whenever you talk, I have things to say. <laughs> but um, I was also thinking about the function of worry of people thinking that they're loyal to whoever, if they're worrying about someone, that that's somehow an act of loyalty or love to worry about them, which of course, all it does is make you distressed. It doesn't keep them safe or do anything for them. Um, the other piece of it is that because, because uh, the way that a worry is constructed with a what if and a something, people have a what if that's about this big, 
And then they have an, it is cancer. What if it is cancer? And then their response is, oh my God, cancer. I've got to think about it. What can I do? Instead of looking at the what if, which David Carbonell calls, let's pretend. Yeah. It's actually your imagination. And just being able to identify that lets you see that it's the way that you're thinking and not cancer that's the issue. I have one more comment to make about, about worrying, which um, I think is sort of interesting because I've queried a lot of patients about worrying and patients who I consider to be pretty solid. I mean, they're, you know, they, they, a lot of them say, you know, believe it or not, I actually feel that worrying really in, in, increases my real life chances of something good happening or protecting myself or some way. There's a kind of almost magical protection that goes on with worrying. So the way you think about it is people don't like to worry, but they don't like not to worry. They feel too vulnerable if they don't worry in some way. So it's a complicated process. So when, when you're trying to work somebody through this and you're trying to get them to the point where they start to take that more mindful approach and they start to do that therapeutic surrender, they really have to leave these faulty beliefs behind, whether it's a sort of a gad loop or it's anticipatory anxiety about, you know, something else or legitimate life stuff. You're dropping your beliefs on the floor that I should. Or at least healthy skepticism. OK, at least question it with with some with with that sort of skepticism in some way because it's very hard for people to drop it and and you know as sally often says our goal with patients is to reduce their suffering and if they can just not be so rigid not hold on to those beliefs quite so rigidly and and they don't worry as much their suffering is reduced and we're helping them in that way yeah yeah, yeah. So, so it's not an all or nothing concept we could probably go for another hour. I know that everybody's going to dig this, but to sort of let's get to the the part that I know everybody's going to want to ask. So I I'm riddled with anticipatory anxiety. What would these two people tell me to do? Like how you know? And by the way, just read the book because they there's a lot to go over here that we can't do in a half hour podcast. But what's the general goal? You start to deconstruct those beliefs, start to look at them a little bit skeptically, understand what the process is, so you can start to realize what's going on. What do I do? How do we get out of this? Well, the Sally came up with a four-part thing, which I think she should talk about. Or one, two, five, three, five. Five, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, definitely... it's, a, it's, a, it's an acronym uh, dance, which um, this is going to test my memory here. Um, the first D is discern or distinguish or designate or basically label the thoughts so that you know that you're in anticipatory anxiety land. So you've got to figure out where you are. Mm -hmm. uh, A is accept, which means um, don't start pushing away at it and trying to get rid of it. Um, N is no all kinds of no's, no uh, engaging with it, no struggling with it, no analyzing it, no pushing on it, no, no trying to get rid of it. C is commit to the action. And E is embrace whatever you're feeling along the way. And it's a, it's a very, it, and it, it, pass. it. And let time pass. Embrace the yeah. moment and, and allow time to pass, which is a yeah. very difficult skill, but it's a, it's, it's, it's sort of central to all forms of modern anxiety treatment, certainly starting with Claire Weeks and going through all the different things uh, up to today. Let time pass right out of the, the Australian grandma manual. Everybody yeah, loves it. <laughs> uh, you got five out of five, though. You didn't even have to think about that. That's congratulations to pass the driver's license test. So, um, a good yeah, yeah. So I appreciate you guys taking the time here. I think that's a great. Is there anything else you want to add? I mean, we we don't have to end now. I'm trying not to keep you guys. I know you're busy, but uh, you know, those are sort of the five steps. But I would urge everybody if you want to know more, I will link this and I'll come back to wrap up at the end so you can go get the book. But there's so much really great information. And the thing that I loved about it is this is not just old school. When you guys are not newly licensed, you've been at it for a little while. Clearly you have a reputation. And I love how you are right here in the 2023 in this book. It's not, this is not old school worksheet thought challenging stuff. 
So there's so no, many great <laughs> concepts here. So many <laughs> concepts in this book. It's not, yeah, it's, it's not, it just just to mention, it is the third of a series. Mm -hmm. And if you read one, two and three, it might make a little more sense. Um, the one is the overcoming um, unwanted intrusive intrusive thoughts, not just any intrusive thoughts, but unwanted ones. The second is needing to know for sure, which is really about checking compulsions and reassurance compulsions and subtle kinds of compulsions that people might not realize are compulsions. Mm -hmm. And this is the third in the series. And they do sort of follow from each other, although they each stand alone as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has them, uh, that ties them together are these three characters that we have in our minds that everyone has, um, worried voice, false comfort, and wise mind. And um, we don't introduce that trio until quite far into the overcoming anticipatory anxiety book. But it, it, the illustrations of the dialogues among these three voices are, are useful ways of being able to observe your own voices and then see what you're doing. Yeah. So I would encourage people to, to think about reading the, others, the other books as well. I will link them too. I've read them all. They're all outstanding. This is such, such excellent ways to explain so many of the things you hear on this podcast again and again and again, like just another set of voices that do a great, great job of explaining. So I appreciate you guys Thank coming you. on. It was really, really great. I appreciate Thank your time you. so much. You're welcome here anytime. So. Thank you. A, yeah. Thank I, you what I'll do is, yeah, I will come back at the end. If you guys hang out to the end, I'll come back, wrap it up. I'll give you a, a URL to go to the anxious slash 247 to get the books and any way that you guys want to me to send people to find you. I will do that. So uh, thank you very much. Nice talking to you. Okay, well, that was amazing. I have actually had Dr. Seif and Dr. Winston both on the podcast before individually. Having them together today was really kind of a special thing for me. I will admit I was doing a little bit of the fangirl thing for a little while there. I'm not above that, by the way. Don't judge me. Anyway, there was a ton of great information in this podcast episode that I think would be helpful because, like was mentioned in the interview, anticipatory anxiety is a common theme, not only with all human beings, because all human beings get nervous about scary and challenging things, but especially across all variants of different anxiety and mood disorders. I think Dr. Steve pointed that out. So hopefully there was a ton here that you can use. If you would like to know more about that, and I'm not a fan of hawking people's books here, well, maybe my own, I guess, but this is the book that we talked about. It's called Overcoming Anticipatory Anxiety. I did get to read it. They were generous enough to send me a copy. It is a great book. I would recommend it along with the other books that they've written and Dr. Winston talked about in the ep in the podcast episode. So if you go right down here to the anxious truth.com slash two, four, seven, that's the full show notes for this episode. I will include links to this book and their other books. And I think uh, they just put out a great blog article on psychology today. I'll link over to their psychology today blog. They are a great, great resource. So take advantage of everything they have to offer. And they are welcome on this podcast anytime they want to be. So that is it. That is episode number 247 of The Anxious Truth on Anticipatory Anxiety in the books. You know that it's over because I have to hit the button and turn up the music. That is Afterglow, written by my friend Ben Drake, who wrote the song at least in part inspired by this particular podcast, and he has let me use it for the past couple of years. I'm grateful for that. Find more about Ben and his music on his website at bendrakemusic.com. And if you are listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or some platform that lets you rate or review the podcast, leave a five-star rating if you dig it, and maybe take a minute and write a review because that helps other people find the podcast, and then more people get the information and the help that they need, which is kind of why I started doing this in 2014 to begin with. Of course, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to hit you to hit, ask you to hit the subscribe button, like the video, leave a comment at least twice a week. I circle back around and go through my YouTube comments. It's always a great discussion there. Thank you guys for your support on YouTube. And that is it. We are done. Share this with everybody that you think might be helpful. I'm, I'm happy to support as many of you as I possibly can with this type of information. I will be back again next week to do another podcast episode and another video. I don't know what I'm going to talk about next week, but I will be here. And remember, as always, this is the way. Feeling that you're gonna win Yeah, you're doing fine Now in the city and you're living fast No looking back or dwelling on the past You know you'll never get another chance 